Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. I'd like to welcome our live stream audiences and those of you who watch later on YouTube. Um, we've done over 700 of these shows since the pandemic started, and we have a great author for you today, uh, Professor James Porter from uh, the University of California, Berkeley, and his book is on Homer, the very idea. Uh, what he means about that is we're going to talk about Homer, but we're even more going to talk about the fact that Homer was basically an idea much more than a person um, and a, a cultural influence much more than a person and how every, every period of time kept shifting in their looks at how they thought Homer should be presented to the rest of the public. Um, we do this in our culture. Every culture does this. Um, and Homer is clearly one that has lasted for longer than, well, so far than Taylor Swift and Beyonce. But we'll see. So, uh, Jim. We, you, you cover in your book. For, first of all, welcome to the Commonwealth. Thank you very much. Uh, it's Thank really you. a pleasure to have you here, uh, especially on such a nice topic. And uh, you cover it so uh, nice and abstractly about the fact that Homer, I mean, even 2,800 years ago, people didn't know who he was um, and who did it, etc. And so Homer has never been a clear character. Uh, it probably takes until you get to Pericles or something like that in Greece before you find a real historical character you can put a, put a name to. So um, let's talk about where Homer originated. Mm. That's about 15 different places, right? Mm. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> let's start with that. Well, the, the short answer is we don't know. Um, mm. There's no information about Homer um, that we can use to identify him as an actual living person. Mm -hmm. um, and so while every culture does have some sort of anonymous poet or author of a poem that is itself anonymously produced over the centuries or millennia, Homer's unique um, because we do have two poems by a poet who was thought to have lived sometime around 700, but not even that is clear. Probably there was no such person. There was just a tradition mm -hmm. of poets. Um, that produced uh, our two greatest epics in the Western tradition, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. And um, the astonishing fact about Homer is that along with the two poems came this image of an author. Uh, for some reason, the, um, there was a need to produce, to generate a concrete person, to give him a life, give him a death, give him an afterlife, etc. Uh, make him practically immortal. So that's very unusual in literary traditions um, mm -hmm. that we would have both a poem and an author who is himself somewhat mythical. Uh, we, of course, are familiar with Shakespeare and, and lots yes. of people saying, well, Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare. Uh, you know, Bacon wrote Shakespeare or somebody else wrote Shakespeare and there's right. all these arguments about it. But the fact is somebody had to be a very good writer to do this. Yes. And I think that that's one of the reasons that Homer's yes. uh, poetry has lasted is that it's so excellently written, maybe not 100% of all 15,000 verses, right. but so often. So why don't right. you talk about the excellence of the poetry for a little while as to why it's... Sure. Well, um, first of all, we have to go back and recognize that Homer was never uh, a writer. Mm -hmm. um, who, with the tradition that produced these two poems were oral traditions. They were sung, mm -hmm. the verses were memorized, they were improvised for audiences, and over from the fall of the Bronze era Age, which would have been around 1200 when the Mediterranean uh, city-state culture, the palace culture collapsed, a set of possibly even earlier than that, uh, songs about wars and songs about returning heroes from wars mm -hmm. Came, you know, came into being at some point, and they eventually consolidated, and we don't know how this happened, mm -hmm. but by the time you get to, certainly by the 6th century, mm -hmm. we have the full body of poetry, it seems, the equivalent of uh, two major novels. Mm -hmm. No one knew then exactly how they were put together. They simply didn't keep tabs on the oral, oral poets. 
Um, and so they are extraordinary. Then going back to your question about excellence, they are extraordinary poems by themselves, and they fit almost hand in glove with each other. Mm -hmm. they, they have a kind of territorial um, respect for the other's boundaries. So mm -hmm. the Iliad is a story about one hero, Achilles at Troy, mm -hmm. and the Odyssey is a story about Odysseus who returns home after the Trojan War is over, and in many ways, in, in every other way, they have nothing in common. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're kind of uh, extraordinary works of art that have been very inspiring. Um, and uh, everyone, everyone in, in ancient Greece and Rome would have known these poems, and by the time they became texts, which would have happened after the introduction of writing, mm -hmm. sometime in the 6th century, they may have been recomposed or edited together. There's stories about that. Uh, at that point, then we had two rough sets of poems, 24 books each perhaps, maybe not in the form of books, but continuous songs that later became mm -hmm. labeled as books. And, and so they became the, the bread and butter of Greek and Roman culture. You just grew up learning how to read and write by reciting Homer and, mm -hmm. and putting him into, onto uh, your chalkboard. And British schoolboys, uh, 2,500 <laughs> years later, were still doing the same we thing. We still with their are. Greek, yes, right? yeah. absolutely. Still are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you you mentioned in passing uh, the 1200s that the the major collapse of of what was Greek civilization, and a lot of people are aware of this, but but I think still mm. uh, it's a really useful setup because 1200 is right around the time of the Trojan War. Now the collapse is not blamed on the Trojan War, but could be part of it. Right. Um, this is the time when Santorini was supposed to have exploded, and, and uh, we don't know whether that what, what hurt Crete, but, but there's that whole period of time, um, and in Egypt, the sea peoples you know, invade around the same time, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of speculation as to what that was, but why don't you give that context okay. about sure. that collapse? So uh, it's one of the most mystifying historical events um, that we know of, where an entire civilization or s multiple civilizations around the uh, Mediterranean Ocean seem to have fallen apart at the same time or more or less within 100 or 200 years of each other. Mm -hmm. And palaces were burnt down and deserted, and, or not deserted, but were reoccupied on a smaller scale. Um, Troy was one of those, but there were everywhere you went in the Levant and to Turkey, it's up today's uh, modern day Turkey, you would find the same kind of uh, collapse. So it's a, a mystery exactly how this happened. Um, war was involved, but probably environmental factors were also involved. But mm -hmm. even there, we don't know exactly what the cause was. Mm -hmm. Earthquakes and uh, earthquake storms are sometimes uh, brought into the explanation, but that's entirely unknown. In any case, um, Homer was linked, his story about Troy is linked to this major systems collapse in some way or other, Troy being a major citadel on the Dardanelles. Um, so, of course, uh, um, this background shaped, I think that the background shaped the very reception of Homer uh, without it, without mm -hmm. this major catastrophic happening in the, uh, in its, um, in the background, um, Homer would have just been another poet. Mm -hmm. But somehow the, uh, the readers of Homer or the poets sensed that there was a major a blackout of civilization earlier, some sort of catastrophic happening, mm -hmm. and Homer preserves the memory of that, and perhaps that's why he's, uh, that's one of the reasons why he's so attractive and compelling as a writer. He carries within him this kind of cultural, sense of cultural trauma as a memory. You, you compare this uh, briefly in your book to um, the uh, Testament, Old Testament stories, uh, the yes. Jewish stories, where uh, there's this story of the Exodus yes. uh, of Moses, but there's also the story of the flood, which is also something, that, it's a story from, actually from Babylon, from before, but it's an idea of something catastrophic happened. Yes. Um, and since prehistory, we kind of get the idea those things happened all the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but probably not. We're waiting to see what epic will be written about 2022. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's, let's hope it's not about this particular interview. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so against that backdrop, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that may be, I, I suggest that that's one of the reasons why Homer was such an important figure, because there was a dim memory of something that was lost mm -hmm. in this entire civilization. And so we have to recall that the poems, in, in the form that we have them, um, the date is sometimes said to be around 700 uh, when these various um, song, songs called lays were fused together into long, longer uh, poems. But we don't know exactly when that happened. But anyway, certainly by the 6th century. Um, 
the um, some, something att something attracted audiences to this magical disastrous happening, the mm -hmm. fall of Troy. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because and we'll go get back to this, I think, towards the end of our conversation. But you mentioned a very big theme, uh, which is how one third of the verses are about war and battle scenes and so on. Yep. And, and why are we, if people keep asking over the centuries, why are we so attracted to this idea? But even at the time when he was becoming, when the poems were becoming famous and, and becoming popular, sixth century, fifth century BC, th this idea that, yes, we do engage in war, but we could be noble about it. Mm, right. <laughs> right? Something, something that redeems us from, right. from the, uh, the right. total uh, you know, shame yes. of what we do in war, maybe. Yes. So that's often, um, that's one of the, I mean, there are many reasons why today and over the centuries people have turned to Homer. Um, first of all, they're in some way romantically attractive. You have Achilles, this extraordinary noble fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, Helen, the most beautiful woman in the ancient world who's been abducted to Troy by Priam's son, mm -hmm. Alexander or Paris, as he's called, um, which unleashes the, the wrath of of the Greeks on the on the mainland, and they come to get her. Um, there, so, and then Odysseus with his return home after this very long, weary ten-year war, um, and then another ten-year journey before he finally gets back home. So, there's a kind of built-in. It's almost like a melodrama in some way. Mm -hmm. There's also a great deal of beauty and um, possibilities for hope at the end of the poem, where Odysseus, uh, so Achilles, and Priam, the king of Troy, get together and basically break bread mm -hmm. and decide to hold off until Hector's body, which Achilles had slain, could be returned to the castle. And then, of course, a week later, or four days later, the Greeks come and sack the place. Mm -hmm. So it's a very ambivalent kind of story. It's heart-wrenching in some ways. Both of these stories are. Um, but you can also imagine that there was a great deal of ambivalence about the value of war. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that um, th we tend to over-romanticize a little bit the Homeric mm -hmm. stories. And part of what I'm trying to do in my book is to point to some of the ways in which things are not quite as pretty as they seem to be the way we read them if we actually pay attention to what's going on in the poems. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of readers that just you know, kind of ignored the facts on the page in yep. order to get what they wanted yep. out of it. Um, you also, before we go into the pictures, you, you, yeah. you talked about how vivid the pictures are yes. that are created by Homer. Yes. And of course, that's what makes a great movie. That's what makes a great, you know, the, the visual imagery mm -hmm. that gets stuck in people's mind. And you mm -hmm. mentioned one particular thing, which was a wall that was built by the Greeks. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's described differently in different places, but it obviously it must have been enormous. And then you think that this was undoubtedly a, a, a fiction, yeah. uh, whether, yeah. whether it ever happened or not, or whether he even knew you. Whether it happened, it was a, a nice, vivid yeah, right. image. Right. And so you say that this has to be destroyed. Um, and so why don't you tell that story? Okay, sure. Yeah. So um, uh, um, first of all, um, let's talk about vividness. The mm -hmm. Greek word is energeia. It means mm -hmm. extremely vivid and energetic and, and, and your, um, visually um, impressive. So tr Homer's poems have the reputation of being extremely vivid. But when you look closely at the poems, you find that a lot of things are simply not described. Mm -hmm. And one of them is we don't get very good pictures of what Troy is like either. Mm -hmm. um, no one actually could vouch for the fact that the Troy, which Troy, which Homer, the poets would have known after the 12th century, was in ruins and half buried under rubble. Mm -hmm. um, so he had to have recreated something um, out, of, out of nothing. A problem happened later on when people started trying to identify the geographical location of the real Troy, and they couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason was that Homer's descriptions just didn't hold up. Mm -hmm. uh, there just wasn't enough there, and the ones that he gave were unclear. Was Scamander this river or that river, uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. so, so the possibility that Homer was such a good visualizer suggested also that he might have actually made things up. Mm -hmm. And this idea influenced readings of this particular structure you're calling the Trojan, uh, the Achaean wall, the Greek wall, which mm -hmm. they built overnight 
in book seven, they decided in the 10th year of a all of a sudden they had to defend themselves against the, <laughs> the invading barbarians, although they were the ones who were the barbarians invading. <laughs> and, um, and they put together the structure, which is, if you look at it de in the details, is structurally incoherent. Sometimes it looks like it's a, another Troy, mm. as big as Troy on a smaller scale, but at least having parapets and defensive walls and ramparts and so on. And other times it looks like it's someone that something that could just be torn apart with a hero's hands. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a, a strange rickety contraption. And there is an explanation of why Homer might have put that there. Mm -hmm. And that is because he was not allowed by the tradition, which was a very strict set of, had a strict set of rules to actually show Troy being taken. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? He gives us an ersatz Troy, which can be taken. Mm -hmm. So then we have this other problem, which is, all right, so then he, uh, at the very, uh, in the middle of the book uh, of the Iliad, in book 12, he has the gods destroy it, as mm -hmm. you were mentioning. And the question is, why did he take so much trouble to build it? And why does he take so much trouble telling us it's gone? <laughs> and at that moment, um, and it's an extraordinary scene, and it is like a natural catastrophe, rivers and the gods, three gods get together, Apollo, Zeus, and Neptune, or Poseidon, and they destroy the place and level it and, and erase it so that it was back to its pristine, original, sandy, uh, play, uh, um, sandy whatever, locale. Um, the, all the traces of this wall were erased. It's almost as if Homer had just simply taken an eraser mm -hmm. and destroyed what he had built. And this is what Aristotle actually says. Mm -hmm. Not a problem, Homer is a poet, he has a right to make things disappear. <laughs> so, so this raises the question of what else is missing and, and why did he make it disappear? And later scholars got together and they came up with this idea that perhaps Homer destroyed it so that no one could ever find it and realize that he had made it up. <laughs> Total circular thinking. Right, but, right. but what shows you the kind of depth of sophistication that, that the Greeks could have about their own mm. uh, iconic canonical works such as Homer uh, and the poet himself, Homer, um, which is something that we, we don't do very well with our own writers today. Well, I was thinking um, that, that, that in current literature, the thing that it reminded me the most is the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, hmm. uh, because in all the movies, uh, there it is. Uh, it's this big, huge uh, creation. But each movie has a different version of it. Um, they're not all the same. Yeah. They're, they're, they're all slightly different models or whatever. Yeah. And it changes over time. Of course, it's yeah. magical. So, of course, it yes. can do that. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, it stands in as, as something that, you know, it, mm. it's clearly the, one of the crucial players in the whole series is this castle. Um, but that doesn't mean it has to be solid. Right. And I, I, I think she, uh, J.K. Rowling uh, is a classicist sufficiently to, I think, have done <laughs> that on, on, on purpose. Okay, yeah. That's very good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're talking about images. You, know, you have some images. Now, before we show the images, it's important to know that this doesn't mean that this is what it looked like. <laughs> this right. isn't what Homer looked like. Right. Yeah. So Let's start with the first. Um, so here's uh, the Louvre Homer, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, a bus. It was probably um, Hellenistic in, in era, uh, a recreation of what Homer might have looked like. And the important thing to note here is that Homer's eyes uh, he has no pupils, um, he's blind, mm -hmm. and he's old, and he looks very serene. He has a, a strap across his head, which indicates a kind of um, some sort of cultic aspect of, of sorts. Uh, Homer was imagined um, as a blind poet, and this goes right to your point about, Anarge about the clarity of, of his perception. Mm. At the same time, the clarity came from where exactly? Not right. from his eyes, but from something else. So we have the choice how to how to analyze that, and one possibility is that he got his, his visual inspiration from the muses, as he says, right. sing to me, muse. Um, but the muses could see, but he could not. Um, and um, the other option is that, uh, as, as later on happened, um, I mean, this is the extraordinary thing. Homer became as powerful a story as the Iliad and Odyssey themselves. Mm -hmm. He was given a life. He was uh, described as having been born from different kinds of circumstances. Um, and uh, in many of, the, uh, many of these stories, which are a, a actual genre in antiquity called the biographies or lives of poets, mm -hmm. and Homer had the most and the longest, mm -hmm. um, in those stories, uh, he was often said to have lived um, up to 160 to 400 years 
mm -hmm. after the event. Mm -hmm. So again, what exactly does that imply? Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, this is this. There were so many different um, types, uh, uh, statuary types of busts of Homer, uh, and even full-length statues. We have none. This is one example, um, and they're simply made up in the mind of the sculptor themselves, you know, whoever it was. Um, just for the audience, the, the, Homer wasn't the only one who, who could be convincing, saying that the muses uh, just inspired me and, and told me what everything was like. I mean, there were plenty of other examples at that time yeah. of people who said that they were inspired by the muses and, and that that was their role in life, and therefore... And even uh, Socrates, the, the, the height of rationality, yes. said mm -hmm. that he had uh, a daemon... Uh, oh, that's very uh, interesting. Uh, ...something yes. that would speak in his, yes. uh, in his ear and give him yes. uh, impressions that yes. he was going to follow. Yeah. So this was sort of part of even the most rational end of the society. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was... Um, uh, the, the ancient Greeks were not immune to believing in magic, Mm -hmm. and believing, believing in the gods, believing in inspiration that comes from on high, and so on. So yes, that was part of the picture. Um, and in many ways, I think Homer had a closer relationship to the muses than any other poet. Mm -hmm. and he had seemed to be a kind of personal, they were his personal um, uh, ties to the divine, whereas Hesiod, another poet, simply says that the muses came and gave him the power of song, mm -hmm. whereas Homer actually speaks to them. And so mm -hmm. it's almost as if he's looking over his shoulder or, or mm -hmm. up above and, and makes, the, it makes the audience feel intimately involved with the divine. So there's a certain magic that goes on with that as well. A magic that Socrates' uh, student, Plato, uh, was upset well, by because yes. he didn't like the way the gods were being described. That's he right. thought they're not being very divine, they're right. being very human. <laughs> so. Hence the paradox. Yeah. Homer being at one time elevated into a divinity, may, and at other times he's kicked out of, uh, out of, well, out of Plato's Republic. He's not allowed to, to live there mm -hmm. um, because he's too damaging morally. And this kind of critique goes way back to Xenophanes and Heraclitus, the early, early pre-Socratic thinkers who mm -hmm. both contested the authority of Homer and said that he was blind epistemologically. He just couldn't see things, and yeah. uh, <laughs> he just didn't know what reality was, according to Heraclitus. And for Xenophanes, mm -hmm. he was, as Plato thought too, someone who maligned the gods, mm -hmm. had them do indecent things. Mm -hmm. And um, the Greeks, I think, probably were more like audiences of Harry Potter than they were <laughs> real believers in the actual divinity of their gods. I, I would right. venture to say they, they had fun with their literature, and I think much the way it may be more so than we do, um, mm -hmm. you know, because they had this kind of intimacy that we no longer have. It's always fun to think that, that the same mistakes you make are made by the gods too, so yeah. it can't be that bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so another example of someone who was inspired um, is a poet called Stesichorus from the, um, around 600 BC, so well before, a century before, it's Anophanes and Heraclitus. Mm -hmm. And uh, he stages a poem in which he says that... Um, uh, it wasn't true, we hear this from Plato, it wasn't true that Helen, you, Helen, sailed to Troy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, you never went there. And he creates this, this counter story, a counter epic, in which not she, but a image, a divine image, an Eidolon, mm -hmm. uh, shaped out of clouds and mist, goes to, to, goes to Troy, and the Greeks end up fighting over nothing, basically a <laughs> phantom. Um, so this is uh, an extraordinary takedown, and he yeah. claims to have the authority of Helen herself. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the Homer's, Homer's authority was being contested right from the very beginning and was always thought to have been contested. Mm -hmm. yeah. Contested, but the fact that his poetry was so good made him the winner in the long run. Everybody wanted to be <laughs> to one up him exactly. <laughs> so this kind of uh, it was like a pebble under the shoe, under the foot in a shoe uh, that generated a great deal of. No one knew for sure exactly what the story with Homer was, but because he wasn't there to defend his reputation, it was very easy to go ahead and challenge it. <laughs> um, so we hear stories later. Even Aristotle indicates two poets who lived at the time of Homer and claimed that they had written their own version of the Iliad before mm -hmm. he had. Mm -hmm. um, so the very fact that, Homer, that these stories existed suggests that, um, that the ancients were pretty well aware that Homer was not the first to come along, and they didn't have a scientific understanding of oral poetry, but they knew that there was something wrong here. Mm -hmm. Same had to do with his name. Mm -hmm. His name was completely made up. No one knew what it actually was. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and it had many different meanings. One was blind. One was that he was a hostage. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
trying to think of other meanings. There were several different meanings that were assigned to the name Homer, but he also had other names like Meliagros, mm -hmm. and he's more often called that than he is called Homer or Melesigenes. Mm -hmm. So the, the, this too was part of the mystique that circulated around Homer. Yeah, sort of like Prince. <laughs> Maybe. Person once named Prince. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so yeah. let's see what else we have here. Um, this is a, a, a painting uh, from the early 19th century, by, um, which is a, a representing a coronation of Homer by Angra, the French painter. He was a classicizing painter. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a, a wonderful um, tableau, which shows um, uh, different figures um, from, if I can go down sure. here, uh, Longinus, Barlow looking at Longinus, who's writing um, a commentary, a literary commentary mm -hmm. on Homer, and uh, Pericles, you mentioned before, uh, right. sorry, Pisistratus, who's uh, holding the scroll of Homer's poetry that um, he would have uh, apparently commissioned a group of, of scholars to get together, or bards, and to create the poems as we know them. This is an apocryphal story, but it just indicates how little was actually known. Mm -hmm. The funny thing here is that he's holding a copy of Homer, and so is Homer. <laughs> um, and Homer couldn't write, but right, right, right. so <laughs> then we have here just very quickly um, the uh, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, blood red with a sword, mm -hmm. and the um, the uh, an allegorical figure of the Odyssey with a broken oar, mm -hmm. representing um, Odysseus's travels. So this was the this was the um, the classicizing image uh, that. Mm -hmm. carried on that ancient idea that Homer was godlike or divinity. Mm -hmm. and, and it still is, in a sense, what is being taught in classes today, which is that Homer is the greatest poet in the West, which is, mm -hmm. may well be true, but that's just half the story. That's just where, what, what counts as being great, I guess, is right. the question we need to ask. Yeah, not necessarily content. <laughs> <laughs> no. So... Yeah. Um, you make an interesting point in your book, too, about how the, the, the head in, the, in this picture by Ingers is um, yes. is is a sort of dead looking, and it's based upon the the sculpture. So, so this is the interesting question: um, Is he being coronated? Uh, is he being divinized? Um, is um, and is he being? Um, so, this the painting is called the Apotheosis of Homer, mm -hmm. and it's modeled after an ancient Hellenistic apotheosis sculpture, a relief sculpture, which I have a picture of later. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is here, is he alive or is he dead? Mm -hmm. Or is he on his way to becoming immortal or is he already dead? And obviously for us, he's dead, but it's not clear whether he's alive or dead. Um, his toe looks to be very alive in the front there mm -hmm. and he's um, got a muscular build, so we can't really say for sure, but um, he is sitting on a marble tombstone um, that indicates that he's already died. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a tension in, this, in the image. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I have another picture here. This is the ancient apotheosis of Homer um, from the third century, uh, found in Rome, but probably Alexandrian. And Homer is here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same uh, gesture. Um, we have t here two Greek um, patrons, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the kings of uh, uh, king and queen of uh, Egypt of Alexandria, um, putting a crown or wreath on Homer, and then the various genre, literary genres coming up to pay their obeisance to the mm -hmm. to the great poet, and f at the very top is Zeus and the Muses, mm -hmm. um, who seem to be the place where he got his in his inspiration and his authority. Mm -hmm. um, question is going to be is here is whether he's being apotheosized or just simply canonized. Mm -hmm. um, what's very interesting, too, is the fact that the Zeus and the Muse's uh, memory don't seem very interested in him. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's yeah. a <laughs> kind of uh, uh, a gap, and, and Homer is being brought down several levels below the level of the gods. So we see that there's a kind of ambiguity here, whether Homer is divine or just simply a human, who has certain good connections upstairs. <laughs> um, and at, at, the, at the base here, uh, we can't see them here, but are mice nibbling away um, at, the, at what looks like a manuscript, which mm -hmm. may be his own book, which may suggest the possibility that Homer's um, permanence was 
fragile. It was recognized that it could be his, his, book, his books could end up in a, uh, as moldy leftovers in the bookstore someday, just you know, <laughs> rotting away. This never actually happened. And works like this made sure that it never did. Yeah. Um, you have a chapter called Apotheosis or Apostasy. Yes. And, and maybe f uh, more people are aware of the word apostasy because mm. it's used in other connections, but maybe you can explain those mm. two words and how, how they're used. Yeah, sure. So apotheosis just means uh, deification. Mm -hmm. Apostasy just means um, uh, re rejecting um, a kind of religious belief, standing aside. It literally means standing off to the side or standing away from. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I, I, th I outline two different ways that Homer was being received in antiquity, understood, and mm -hmm. one was this very positive God, you know, deifying, uh, elevating, classicizing, perhaps, yeah. um, reading, and the other was taking him down. Mm -hmm. um, and we can see some of that ambivalence here, the way Plato would, or the way Zoilus, mm -hmm. who was called the, the scourge of Homer, because he, <laughs> he whipped um, Homer with his criticisms and mm -hmm. showed how foolish um, Homer made some of his heroes appear. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, Diomedes, a Greek hero, has it looks like he has flames coming out of his helmet. Mm -hmm. And, and Zoilus, who was writing around the time of Plato, said, uh, oh, this is silly. It looks like he's going to catch on fire. Yeah. And so <laughs> <laughs> to, to be able to have that kind of margin of um, that room for maneuver with Homer is extraordinary. He could be both elevated to the gods and, and kicked down into the gutter or out of this out of these um, contests, but as he was by Heraclitus with another. He said, Her Heraclitus said, Homer must be thrown out of the, the Algones, the musical contests, um, with the Rabdos, with his own stick, the stick that he's holding here, which mm -hmm. indicates his own um, kingly uh, status as a poet. Well, we do the same thing with celebrities today, right? We, we deify them, and then we, all, we, so. we have a, you know, several magazines yes. devoted to making their, their, mud, uh, uh, their clay feet shown. Right. right? Very, very, very right. Yes, yeah. true. And this is, uh, I think, probably universal in, in, in culture. Um, but Homer really got the worst of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, in well, tell many the story ways. of what they said about how he died, you know, uh, with the Delphic Oracle. Okay, order. sure. So it's just, a, a, you know, no. just to show how low the story can get. Yeah. Let's <laughs> see if I have a picture here. Mm -hmm. um, we'll come back to this maybe later. So uh, at the v there is one of the one of the works which is called the the contest of Homer and Hesiod, mm -hmm. which belongs to that long that genre of li literary lives. Mm -hmm. um, but it's in many ways a compilation. The last hand that we know about that added anything to it would have been Alcidamus, mm -hmm. who lived also around the time of, of um, Plato, and um, Homer wanders around uh, the countryside, um, increasingly blind and. Um, we get different variations. In fact, we get different lives mushed together into one, this one particular one where there's a contest between the two poets to see who was the better poet. Mm -hmm. Homer loses, uh -huh. which is an extraordinary thing by itself, <laughs> against, against the urgings of the populace, the, populace, uh, the, the, the Greek demos, as I said, mm -hmm. uh, who really thought that Homer should have won. Um, and then he goes off a few adventures, makes some more poetry, writes his Iliad and writes his Iliad and Odyssey, because in these stories he's literate, mm -hmm. and then eventually ends up on uh, Ios. Um, uh, he, two um, points that come up here. One is that he, at some point, goes to the Delphic Oracle, I think that's what you were mentioning, mm -hmm. to ask, uh, who, where did I come from? Who was my mother? Uh, who was my father? And, and the Oracle said, um, beware of Ios, because there your death will lie. You will, don't go to that island, and that's where you maybe are from. It was said to be one of the places that he could have come from. Mm -hmm. So he somehow stumbles into Ios at the end of his life, and uh, he says, beware of the, beware, the oracle said, beware of the riddle of the fishing boys. He sees, sees or hears two fishing boys, or several In the fishing picture boys. There, right? they're, they're right there. This is a, uh, a later representation from Pompeii. Mm -hmm. And um, a, a, it's written above is Homer's name and right. Ales, Hales, which means fisher boys. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they present him with a riddle. He, he says, what are you doing? And they said, well, what we caught, we left behind. And what we haven't caught, we carried. What we caught, we took with us. And what we couldn't, sorry, let me try one more time. Mm -hmm. What we caught and saw, 
um, we left behind, but what we couldn't see, uh, we took with us. Yeah. And the answer to that um, riddle was lice. And, uh, lice. So lice has been around. Right? Lice <laughs> have been here forever. <laughs> a very demeaning uh, mm. kind of episode where the great riddler who would beaten Hesiod in con riddling contests mm -hmm. can't even handle, you know, two uh, whippersnappers um, mm. on the seashore. And so he stumbles on the mud, um, a few days later dies, and then he writes this epitaph to himself, mm -hmm. um, which was what we saw at the base of, of, um, of the, um, of the, statu of the um, apotheosis by Angra, the French mm -hmm. painter. And, um, and here, this wall painting has uh, in it um, the riddle itself. It's almost as if the riddle was more famous than the... It's the exact same scenario. He's sitting at a throne, um, but he's being dethroned by two two little kids. So I think one of the things that's very useful to talk about this, this is, this is a fresco in a home in Pompeii yeah. that was uncovered recently, but yeah. it was, of course, uh, painted 2,000 years ago yeah. when, when Homer was already 700 years into being famous. Yes. So this is a little like pictures of George Washington in lots of people's homes and yes. that Homer is everywhere. Yes. And yeah. that, that he's a cultural icon. Yeah. Or I, I thought also maybe Robin Hood. Uh, yeah. You know that there's all these stories of Robin Hood and, sure. and the images are there, and you and you you mentioned the fact that he's both a generic uh, image and and a specific one, and I right. think Robin Hood kind of fits that. You know, he's got yes. green tights and yes. and a certain hat, but yes. you know he doesn't always have the same beard, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. So he's uh, he's recognizable um, as Homer, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a very realistic portrait in many ways. It was. I'm not sure. I think it was found in the late 18th century and it was restored and, and drawn. This was a drawing made in the 19th century mm -hmm. and it's very much faded now. But, um, but yes, uh, that's the interesting thing is that he was uh, depicted in so many different ways throughout antiquity. Mm -hmm. and, and it's almost as if, um, uh, uh, as if audiences were responding, were responding to the person more than the poems. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and that's part of the reason why why um, the, the theme, one of the main themes of my book is this question whether Homer, uh, which is actually a statement, a restatement of a thesis by Vico and mm -hmm. also by um, Nietzsche, the philosopher, whether Homer was a person who was later made into an idea or was he an idea that was made into a person. <laughs> and there seems to be no way of, of getting around, you know, we can't figure out which of these is right, but we can't somehow not imagine an author of the poems. Mm -hmm. And yet we have to recognize that it's nothing more than a, you know, um, a colorful idea. Chicken and egg uh, question, but in this yeah. case, uh, you know, I think when it comes to authors, very few people feel that really excellent writing can be done by a committee. Mm. I mean, that a lot of people are. So, so, you know, maybe some poem did the best part, some poet did the best parts, and right. then, and then uh, other ones, you know, collected them revise yes. them, put yes. things in. You know, I mean, there, there are posthumous uh, novels by different authors that were put together by the uh, editors, yes. you know, where they, the bulk of it was done by the actual writer, and they're so familiar with their writing that they can fill in the gaps, and, and you know, a good, a good yeah. literary uh, crit crit critic can see where the mistakes the themes are. are, yes. But, but, but still, most of it is done by the, the original author, yeah. something like that. So that, that, that was a suspicion. Um, mm -hmm. There were thoughts that maybe, you know, what we have in Homer today, or which is what the Alexandrians had in the third century at the Library of Alexandria, mm -hmm. was not the Homer that was passed down through the generations. We just don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. But that was a conclusion uh, that Friedrich August Wolff, a great philologist, mm -hmm. who wrote a pro prolegomena to Homer in 1795, floated for the first time, which was the poems were, in fact, put together mm -hmm. by later sup, you know, people who came along and suppl supplemented what was missing and, and produced a text that had no real... It did have a kernel of authentic hom homericity, if you like, mm -hmm. and he thought it was the first, um, I think, 16 books that he thought were, tr were Homer's and not the last eight. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but how did he know? How could we ever tell? Mm -hmm. So the thought is is uh, would drive you mad if you tried to pick apart the layers of Homer. But mm -hmm. but that is a fact that the poems came to us mm -hmm. um, very much scarred by the the tradition that sent them down to us. And so we uh, good scholars tend to see the these seams or these places where the 
um, where the the stitching is falling apart a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a very destructive way of reading, and I'm not sure we can actually confirm it in our mind. So yeah. uh, that was not my, my issue in this book, per se. No. My, I think, if anything, I was trying to show that the Greeks were as capable of having doubts and nonetheless working with what they had as we are today. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they were, we haven't really progressed much further. I no, think. we haven't. Um, but speaking of uh, progression, um, our live stream audience, if you have any questions that you'd like okay. to ask of Professor Porter, just uh, send them in through the chat room and I'll get a hold of them. Okay. So um, we, we skipped let's a couple pictures. Do you want to back up? And uh, maybe so. Let's see what I, I'm trying to remember what I have. Um, this is where so we, we mentioned that about the dead head. On yes, the, on I think body. that's what you were referring to. Okay. Yeah. So this is a sketch by Angra and uh, made around the time that he was studying, making studies for his apotheosis. An extraordinary um, image. I call it the cyborg Homer um, because his head is actually modeled after a marble Louvre statue. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, it's affixed on this living body. And behind him is um, a... Orpheus, one of the precursors to the Homeric poems, mm -hmm. according to ancient mythology, whispering, we don't know what, into Homer's ears, if he can <laughs> actually hear them. Um, so this, to me, sums up the tradition in so many different ways of how we understand Homer as being both alive and dead and mm -hmm. um, uh, somehow lasting eternally, but also mortal and fleshly, fleshly and, um, and fragile. And I think that keeping all of these extremes together in our minds is probably the richest way of understanding what Homer's doing. Yeah, layers. All right, so that's, that's let me see what we have here. This, this was a very interesting. So this is a, so here we have another study that was made by Angra at the time. And it's, uh, the title is um, Tradition on a Pedestal. And the tradition turns out to be very much Homer. And he is the tradition, but he's been hollowed out mm -hmm. and made into a silhouette. And mm -hmm. so, uh, in many, t in, from in my mind, that to me is what tradition is. It's this outline mm -hmm. that we get, f it gets filled in as mm -hmm. we, um, as it progresses through the eras. But and here we have a kind of X-ray vision of what that tradition is. Uh, a politician's ideal, right? To to be a, <laughs> faceless a, a, a and faceless and an X-ray something that everybody to everybody can, <laughs> and can, can decide who you are and vote precisely, for precisely, precisely. Yeah. Maybe uh, a little bit like Helen, too. She was... Oh, yeah, the yeah. most beautiful woman in the world, but right. we don't ever see what right, she looks exactly. like, right? Yes, <laughs> can imagine. Because then everybody would argue. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's this one. You know. That's right. Uh, we, have, we have one question right about this uh, the picture, okay. so I'm going to ask it right now. Right. So uh, regarding the image like Ingress's or apotheosis, how many people would have seen paintings like this back when it was done? And, and is that similar to the social media of the time? Yes. Like it would get displayed, so that's, that's the question. So Absolutely. it would be in a museum and... How many people would come to see it? Okay. Thousands. If we're talking, yes. I mean, yeah. so Angra's painting was one of the most famous at the time, 1824 or five, and it was. We're talking post Napoleon. Uh, yes, thanks. and and it was, um, and also post uh, David, so the the mm -hmm. other his competitor, um, but it was um, also put together. It was displayed in a, uh, um, uh, in a, I forget now the name. It was like a kind of World's Fair mm -hmm. in held in France. So it was. It received lots of um, of likes, if you like, <laughs> um, and that's that. That is one of the ways in which audiences made contact with uh, the past through paintings and mm -hmm. sculptures. And so he's just carrying on that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's a, an excellent uh, question. I think it. Um, there's one other um, point, I suppose, is that you can measure precisely measure the popularity of a figure like Homer by how many images he had. Mm -hmm. um, the way we would have, you know, so many hits on a, on a, um, a Facebook site, as were. And, uh, and there was probably cheating. Is that just like there is in the Soviet Union, how many Lenin uh, statues there are doesn't mean how popular he was. Huh. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so we, we uh, social media also has its cheaters. As, yes, as I'm sure that's likes true. There are. They get all their friends to do it 10 times yeah, or whatever. Yeah, it's very hard, <laughs> very hard to tell. But, but yes, that would be but the... But generally, it's an accurate way to yeah, do it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. that would be the... The, the closest there was to something like uh, our, our social media in the ancient um, days. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I have too many more images to show. Let me see what, what is here. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, here's one more. Um, why not imagine Homer as a woman? Um, but Great idea. Samuel Butler did. <laughs> uh, he created uh, this, this person, the Nazi, the muse, he said his muse, um, 
who uh, was the authoress of the Odyssey. He wrote a book in the 1890s. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hilarious send-up of uh, scholarship. Um, and, um, and he found this painting. It's a long story, but he found this painting in Cortona in a museum and decided that that was the authoress of the Odyssey. And <laughs> Uh, the interesting thing is that he can't be disproved. <laughs> uh, there's nor could you, nor could you prove anything about Homer either. So that was part of his point. He he's uh, he was actually a, what he was doing was not simply spoofing Homer, mm -hmm. but he was drawing on the traditions itself that he knew about from mm -hmm. hell, from the second sophistic writers, Diochrysostom, mm -hmm. uh, Philostratus, and so on, who challenged Homer and made fun of him and said mm -hmm. that the Trojan War never actually ended the way Homer said, and Troy was never captured, and Helen never went there after all, et cetera. So he fits into that tradition too. It's a very learned spoof, if you like. And yeah, and Samuel Butler was, was, a, was quite a, a scoundrel in the way he liked to write about everything. I mean, oh yes. he, he took everything down in a very, very funny way. So this is, I had not heard of this, but it certainly fits uh, his other writing. And I think just, uh, just to k complete the uh, historical arc for people uh, quickly, mm. um, we were in Pompeii, and then uh, a couple hundred years later, uh, Greek wasn't studied anymore, basically, and the Latin Empire, uh, yes. the Roman Empire went down. So for maybe a thousand years, there was almost no Greek. So there was no Homer because yes. there was no Greek. So right. Homer disappears for a while. Yep. And then he's brought back by Petrarch. Uh, and, and the Renaissance gets them. Like everything in the Renaissance, everything class classical was wonderful. And then another couple hundred years later, we have all the critics coming back. Yes. Yeah. And, and so that's where we are with, with Butler and, and uh, Nietzsche and so on and so forth. Yes. Where we've arrived at that point. Yes. OK. So um, first of all, with Petrarch, just remember, he didn't actually know Greek. So he commissioned right. a translation from a manuscript. Mm -hmm. It was the first Latin translation, a terrible one. And <laughs> l but this was in 1363, 65. And then eventually, better translations were made, and Homer became legible again. And eventually, uh, editions in Greek, critical editions, started to appear. And that's when Homer gained a footing. There was always a kind of seesaw um, effect, but a uh, seesaw struggle between Virgil and Homer. Mm -hmm. Whenever Latinity was on the rise, Virgil did well, and when Greek came back in, and Phil Hel not just Phil Hellenism, but Helena um, mania of some sort, then uh, then Homer did well. These cultural intellectual fights, uh, like between Homer and Virgil, and between Plato and Aristotle in the Middle Ages, are kind of funny. You know, it's yeah. like n nobody nobody imagines. The fights, well, at least yeah. ever since yeah. uh, Gore Vidal and, and yeah. Buckley. We forget I mean, about them. We, we don't think, uh, yes. Yeah. No, there were actual almost world wars were waged among scholars over mm. whether Homer was or wasn't a good poet. Right. And, and the critiques came very quickly. Um, but, um, but also, before they, they cr crept up, uh, we have to um, remember that um, Dante, um, in his uh, trilogy, uh, The Divine Comedy, actually is led by the hand by Virgil, mm -hmm. but he calls Homer the poeta sovereno, the, mm -hmm. the supreme poet, mm -hmm. although he had never had read him either because right. there were no translations available. So <laughs> uh, it's an interesting balancing point. But then, yes, then, then the wars, culture wars, really took off again mm -hmm. in the 18th century and, and all the way up through Nietzsche as well. Yeah. Yeah. And beyond. And beyond. Yeah. yeah. It's not over yet. Mm -mm. I, hope, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> All right, any other images? Uh, um, that may be the end, let's see. Oh, oh. no, this That's is just Troy, a, right? a picture of Troy with its many layers. Um, and th I, I introduced this in the book to make a comparison with a short story by Borges called yeah. The Immortal. I recommend it to everybody. It's just 15 pages of mm -hmm. mind-blowing madness <laughs> um, in which Homer is reincarnated over and over again. And, but the interesting thing about the story is that he, he ends up in a kind of inverted Troy, which has as many layers as, as this particular, this is a 19th century post Schliemann mm -hmm. um, map of the nine layers of Troy and uh, representing from the top, the, the most modern to the bottom, which go well below, the, well before the time when Homer would have written his poems or sang his poems, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, and Schliemann was the one who discovered this. Mm -hmm. uh, he dug a little bit too deeply, and mm -hmm. he ended up back in the early Bronze Age, and he was looking for Homer's mm -hmm. Troy, and he never found it. And the interesting question today is, you know, have we actually got it? And mm -hmm. uh, it's not at all clear that this is, is the, Homer's, the Troy that Homer would have either seen or not seen. Yeah. 
it, well, and the, the Schliemann story is almost as good as the, as the, as the Homer story versus the poem. Mm. Because, yes, he, he found Troy, but did he really find Troy? And did he find the right Troy? Right. And, and, you know, he put all the gold on his wife, you know, and, and had her take pictures of it with all the... the oh, yes. All, yes. All, all the personal stuff. And, and was he crazy or did he know what he was doing? And that's all almost as interesting, you know, to everybody as, yeah. as is this a really good way to describe what happened on yeah. the site, which we call yes. Troy, yes. Uh, over the centuries or over yeah. the millennia? You should say. Yeah. So, so what you're talking about there is this incredible passion that the search for Troy or the mm. search for Homer mm. still instill, instilled in someone like Schliemann, mm -hmm. complete romantic, mm -hmm. um, but he had enough money to make his dreams come true, and mm -hmm. he did everything to, to verify what he thought was the case. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just the kind of thing that, that, you know, when we're looking at how we've lived our lives and we want to see how other people have lived their lives and uh, these extremes make us more comfortable with being a little bit more mediocre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps so, yes. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I, th I don't think I have any... No, I just I have this have, last yeah, image, perfect. which is advertising. Yeah. But Great. here we have the three different uh, versions of Homer um, from Marble Bust to the drawing by... Um, that was used for the apotheosis by Angra to the cyborgian um, Homer at the very bottom. Well, let's talk a little bit about Nietzsche. Okay. He's always interesting. All right. So, so he, he comes on and he's, uh, well, he just has a lot of different ideas, which he just doesn't. Uh, Join us this new year for new conversations epigram, at the Commonwealth Club. Getting everybody Club. thinking. Um, but he's both for classicism and against it and so on and so forth. So why don't you tell a little bit of how he reacted to Homer? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, um, Nietzsche was an incredibly gifted young uh, uh, classicist who got tenure before he actually published a dissertation or had actually written one. <laughs> um, he got tenure based on a few articles that he had done. And uh -huh. then for his, his official uh, speech when he, entered, he was in Basel in Switzerland, he gave, a, 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 um, he gave a, um, a presentation on Homer and classical philology. Mm -hmm. uh, which was um, a very paradoxical kind of piece, um, worrying about whether we can actually say we know the real Homer is and, and why that's so difficult to, um, to assemble. What, what kind of fiction is necessary for us in order to be able to read the poems? Can mm -hmm. we read the poems without imagining a single author for them? And mm -hmm. it's very difficult to do. The coherence of the poems, and I think this is what he's mm -hmm. getting at, is overwhelmingly... Um, um, Indubitable. There's just no way that we can. I think, if they were produced by a series of bards uh, over centuries, we can only admire the um, the ingenuity of these very mm -hmm. sort of uh, to us primitive, mm -hmm. but in fact very sophisticated poets who were able to put together these extraordinary scenes. Mm -hmm. um, I could say a little more about Nietzsche yeah. if you're interested. Okay. Yeah. So, so then in the later later eras, Nietzsche came back to. Um, um, to Homer, actually right away. Um, so in, that was in 1869 when he gave this particular speech on Homer and classical philology, which left everybody in the audience scratching their heads. What is he saying? You know, yeah. Can we actually know Homer? Was he going against the German scholastic tradition or not? And in 1872, he produced another couple of essays on Homer um, and, um, and Homer and was bringing out this notion that I think he was trying to embarrass us with this question that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we're so attracted to a work of art that is so involved with bloody mayhem and danger mm -hmm. and, and death? And, and his answer is that, uh, seems to be that we have very dark aspects in our souls and we don't always confess to, the, to that. And so we transfigure the dark appreciation for death, et cetera, which we lust after in some strange way um, into an aesthetic beauty of some sort. Mm -hmm. So he was attacking the aestheticization of Homer and, uh, and, and questioning the hypocrisy of readers who can, like Goethe and Winckelmann and others, who just saw nothing but beauty mm -hmm. when they looked at Homer and could ignore the, the bloodshed that was everywhere. That inaugurated a, an entire critique of war in Homer into mm -hmm. the early 20th century when during the war, middle of the 20th century, um, when war was actually raging, we had three Jewish-German, uh, four Jewish-German uh, authors. Uh, each of them devoted a long essay or a book to Homer and the Iliad mm -hmm. uh, or Homer and the Odyssey. 
Um, so Simone Weil, um, mm -hmm. Homer the Poem of Force, or um, Rachel Bespalov on Homer, both of them from the early 1940s, Eric Auerbach's first chapter in, mm -hmm. um, on Odysseus's scar, and um, Adorno and Horkheimer in their dialectic of enlightenment. And in every case, they critiqued the, the, critique, the premise of, of taking pleasure in, in a war poem. Um, so this goes back to your initial point, um, uh, which is, can we, can we simply um, ignore the violence? Can we aestheticize it? Can we um, beautify it and make ourselves, ourselves feel better by doing what I would call reparative readings, mm -hmm. where, where we repair the damage uh, by looking for, overlooking uh, mm -hmm. the damage itself? And, uh, none, and these are the, probably the, the four, three or four most powerful readings of Homer that, have, that I've come across myself. Um, mm -hmm. Very, very, they're, they're attacking not Homer, mm. they're attacking readings of Homer, mm. the way in which he was being read at the time, and of course the Nazis appropriated Homer as well. So, right. and, and they appropriated Nietzsche. They, through a bad reading of Nietzsche, exactly. Yeah. So it's uh, unfortunate. It's a, interesting that, you, that he makes this point, which would seem to undercut the nobilization of violence under the Nazis, um, but that didn't stop them either. And just like you said about Homer, and, and, and uh, one other comment that I had about when you're talking about Nietzsche, you know, I, I think writers most of the time are going to make the assumption about Homer, that, uh, about the plays, I mean, the, uh, the poems, yes. that, that they were written by w mostly one person. Yes. Because they know what it takes to write something coherent, how hard that is. Yeah. How hard is it for more than one person to do that in one yeah. piece of literature? Very hard. Very hard, but yeah. very possible. Possible. And, possible. And, and it's very likely that, in fact, the opposite was the case. I, mean, I think right. that it was really a tradition that was so sophisticated mm -hmm. that it preserved, um, it produced complexity, mm -hmm. maybe because it was so diffused, and, um, and was nonetheless coherent in a way. Um, yeah. And then someone came along, perhaps, as an editor and put the parts together, but mm -hmm. they were already implicitly there. It's impossible to know. We right. just simply... We can't do it. So the question is, can we read without that assumption or not? And is that the only thing that matters when we look at a poem? Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, and you bring it up, um, that, that this uh, way to analyze Homer and the poems, literary criticism, is yeah. also what was applied to the Bible at the same time, yes. especially in Germany, yes. et cetera, et cetera, from yes. the 18th century, 19th century. The there was a whole trend towards that. And that same kind of criticism... Which, which I thought must have been awfully fun for the, the, the professors that got involved in it, were the linguistics mm -hmm. you know, at the time of figuring out that actually all of our languages have roots that are very similar. I mean, and, and that some languages are connected with each other and some of them aren't. That was also the same right. 18th, 19th century linguistic uh, criticism studies that were going on. Yeah, eventually this Indo-European um, notion came up as a, the common mother of all languages. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, and this is the unfortunate thing about the tr German tradition, is that um, uh, it was greatly influenced by biblical criticism that was just beginning to take root in the end of the 18th century. Um, but at the same time, um, it, was the, it was somewhat of a toxic environment. Um, it was a very anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. anti-Semitic um, uh, uh, way of going about things. Uh, Wolf himself excluded the study of the Near East um, as being not on the same level in terms of literature and culture as mm -hmm. the civilization of Greece and Rome. Right. So that, unfortunately, that came with, um, that was part of that tradition as well. Came with the territory. Yep. I mean, it's the yep. same thing. I mean, Hegel did this great study of history, but then, of course, he decided that the 19th century in Germany was the height. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How can you, <laughs> yeah. even, even great analysts seem to succumb to this kind of, <laughs> you know, personal, Personal yeah. bias, you yeah. know, almost immediately. Hard, hard to get out of it, that's for sure. Yeah. There's been some very interesting work done uh, recently by a colleague of mine, Ron Hendel, in the Near Eastern Studies pro program, um, uh, showing, among, and he's not alone, uh, indicating that Exodus was itself a kind of invented myth mm -hmm. um, that uh, very much the way the Greeks seem to have invented their own myth about their ancestry uh, mm -hmm. belonging to the invaders of Troy, um, and so uh, this gives a, a, a somewhat different kind of spin on, on the way Homer is being used as a kind of national icon. He was f used to develop a, f a, th a kind of nationalism, some sort. Right. 
No, we have we have a couple more questions. Okay, here. yeah, let's, to, okay, fine. Uh, one of them we, we talked a little bit about, but you can say some more. Paul Switzer asked, "Was there a period post antiquity when Homer was mostly forgotten or ignored?" So, yeah. the one you mentioned in the medieval period, mm -hmm. uh, when Greek uh, was no longer read except in the East and Byzantium, and Greek texts uh, w were in, were May, you know, were inaccessible and, and wouldn't have been able to be translated until much later anyway. Um, in, in their place, what they had were uh, pseudo uh, fictions by Darius and Dictus, uh, two, forged, two sorts of forgeries, mm -hmm. which claimed to have been written by individuals who were present at Troy, uh, present before the, um, Homer was, uh, at Troy and actually knew what was going on in, the, uh, in Troy. And so this is another example of um, it, it, this kind of, of one-upsmanship, I was going to say. Um, this, um, uh, this uh <clears throat> the medieval traditions almost supplanted Homer, um, but only because he was just not available. Mm -hmm. And then once he was brought back in, they were discredited. You yeah. know? And, and Paul sort of asked uh, a follow-up question, which was, how about in Byzantium, which you mentioned? Yeah. How about what did Homer last during the entire time? The entire time. time. He was always there. He was, he was always, always available. Yeah. We have commentaries from one of the best is by Eustathius, who lived around 1200. And, mm -hmm. and uh, it, he wrote two massive volumes of commentary on the Iliad and the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. And it's thanks to him and people like him who were in his, in his period. There were others as well. Um, uh, that we that they they what they did was basically collect the wisdom of earlier scholarship and put it into its own kind of package and mm -hmm. and used it for teaching uh, right. students in the schools um, how to read Homer. They were like commentaries that we would have today in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So uh, another couple of of uh, historical areas. So there's yeah. the library in Alexandria that that flourished until three four hundred. Yes. Uh, AD, and then there was the House of Wisdom in, in uh, uh, yeah. Baghdad, yeah. which went around and collected all those things. Now, uh, uh, we know that in Alexandria that Homer was, was a very important mm. fi figure uh, still, but the, uh, my question is, I know that they did Plato and they did other Greeks and stuff like that in, in, the, in Baghdad. Mm. Uh, yeah. That's around the 700, 800, yes. something like that. Yeah. Do you know whether they looked into Homer? Not that I'm aware of, yeah. um, no. They were, uh, these were probably Islamic uh, philosophers right. and they right. were interested in translating Plato, especially Aristotle. Right. Um, and they, it was because of their activity that Aristotle um, was resuscitated and revived all the way into the early modern era. Right. Um, Homer, I don't believe so. I'm not aware of anything like that. Mm -hmm. you know, Great. Not to say that there wasn't, there weren't readers of Homer in, in that part of the, of the world. Um, but it wasn't, but it wasn't, uh, that was wasn't. It was not a not center of scholarship. Yeah, of it, because yeah. they, they brought in information from yeah. India and it, yeah. it was a great, a great uh, university center. If mm -hmm. It might not be called a university, yeah. but something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, one last question. Okay. So um, you were obviously uh, lived uh, a big part of your professorial life and, and academic intellectual life being part of the cultural conversation about Homer. Uh -huh. So how did, you, how did you find Homer as a place to, to, uh, to make part of your life with? Ha, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, first of all, as a classicist, it's impossible not to. Um, he's, uh, he was the first text that I read in Greek, actually. Mm -hmm. It was a very unwise decision, but I was in <laughs> high school, and, and there was a Jesuit textbook by Schrader and Schrader, I think it was called, or Schroeder and Schroeder, and it, was, uh, it introduced you to Greek the easy way by reading passages of the Odyssey. <laughs> it ruined my Greek, because that's not what you're supposed to do. You have to go through the Attic uh, system and then go back to Homer, which I eventually did. Mm -hmm. And it was impossible to avoid teaching him, but I, I love to teach Homer. It's, mm -hmm one of my favorite um, you know, forms of literature, there's no question. So I've been, I've been thinking about Homer forever, um, probably 20 years, at least 20 odd years. And, um, uh, and some, I actually, this is an embarrassing fact, but I, I secured a contract for this book in 2005 around, uh -huh. and I didn't get to it until 2020, um, 21. And uh, because Thanks I had just too many other things <laughs> to do in between. <laughs> and, um, and then I started wor working in, in earnest on the book and um, wrote to my editor, who's a wonderful editor at uh, um, Susan Bilstein at Chicago. And she said, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you're writing way too much. This is supposed to be a tra kind of trade book for <laughs> lowbrow scholarship, et cetera, and make it accessible and short. <laughs> and I had a heart attack. And I don't do very well with writing short. <laughs> but um, I did sit down and, and actually try to compress everything into 
into about 200 odd pages, which uh, yeah. ended up being what happened. And, um, well, well you, you, you say you didn't do a good job of it, but you did a very good job of it. Oh. And uh, I think everybody will appreciate both this hour uh, of looking into your scholarship on Homer and also the book thank you. Um, for those yeah. who are interested in more details. Okay. So thank you very much for joining us. So ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thanks for joining us. See you again.